Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are located. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to share that Studio Designer is set to release the 2022 Design Benchmark Report. Order that today at 15% off list price. Many firms are in the planning stages for next year and this report can help your firm make critical business decisions like fee structures, hiring decisions, and more. Set actionable goals for the year with powerful data and insights. And I will be sending out a direct link to this information through the uh, GoToWebinar chat. So for today's webinar, here's our agenda, our introduction, training session, webinar instructions, Q&A, and next steps. Today's webinar is going to be about the topic preparing for year end, part two. This is gonna be part two of three. And the training webinar will be led by our consultant partner, Marie Lieno. A little bit about her firm, working over a decade in studio designer servicing users worldwide. Marie's firm, Marie Vuitton, is the rebranding of her accounting firm business, focusing on more content and training as the best way to maximize efforts and help business owners grow. So at the end of the webinar, feel free to submit your questions or during the duration of the webinar, submit your questions here in the control panel box as shown on the right side of the slide. At the last 15 to 20 minutes of the webinar, We'll get to those questions, as many questions that we can as possible. So now I'm going to go ahead and switch this over to Marie herself, and she's going to kick this off for us. Hi, Marie. How are you? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining my uh, webinar series, part two of three. And um, basically, uh, Hopefully many of you were in attendance on part one of this series, which aired last month. Um, the topic was year end project closeout. And if you weren't on the call, you can totally check it out on my YouTube channel or my website. I think Studio even has it posted um, on the airs, okay? Um, so that, and you, you can also reach out to me with any questions. I know a lot of you have in the, in, in the last two, okay? So my contact information, I think, uh, will be shared later on uh, in this webinar. Okay, so if um, for today's topic, I chose annual financial review. It seems quite fitting for this time of year. And um, if you are a client or subscriber, you've probably received reminders from me to book early because of the growth my business experience is experiencing. So um, what exactly is an, an annual financial review. Well, for me, this is the process that I go through to close out the year. For those of you that are new to studio, okay, um, don't be alarmed because you will see, you know, big bright red letters that kind of tell you that it's time to close the year um, when you return from the holidays, okay? So, um, before we walk over my actual review process, I wanna make sure you understand what actually happens. Like, what does it mean? What, what exactly does it mean when we say close out the year? You know, um, what, what exactly uh, are we doing when we click that button? And, um, you know, why Studio warns us about um, only having two years open. So um, I am gonna pull this back up on my screen, um, but I wanted to uh, go ahead and show you in Studio. So from the accounting, and you will always notice that I have a lot of uh, tabs open. I do that on purpose. Okay, and in through here under accounting, when you see close the year, this is what it's gonna take you to. And Studio allows for two periods to be open. So for somebody that started this year, this might be this might be what you see when you open it. Okay. For those of you that have been with us for a while, and, and Studio has been around for a very long time, um, you may see something different. Okay. It's always two periods at a time, and what that means is you're not going to be you're not going to want to first off do anything in periods that are closed, okay? When you close out a period, you're basically allowing the system to date everything for the current year. So again, we're gonna pretend that it's it's 1231 because we're obviously not there yet. 
right? So at 1231, what it's going to do, do is going to, you know, tell me to, that we need to close the period. Okay. And it warns you, you're not going to mess anything up, but that's what it does. Now, if you need to then backdate anything, like let's say I went, oops, I messed up something and I needed to put something in 1231-21, I would not be able to do that. Okay. So you guys really need to be mindful of that, um, especially when it's the end of the year. Okay. It's not scary to close, but there are some things that I like to have everybody do before we, we actually close the period. And mo most of you already know that it does do things in real time. So if you post something today, it's going to be dated today, unless you change the date. Okay. And there's some things that you can't change the date for. And, and, and I know if you've been with us for a while, you know that those are like invoices and things like that. It's dated the day that we create it. Okay. So that's just a little bit about that, but um, I do want to jump back into um, my actual processes. And um, if I didn't give this to Sarah, this this can be a handout. Um, but this is, I try to really keep things simple here. Okay, the, this is it. These are the three steps that I do. Um, usually, when you're going through this, there there will be a time if any of you find issues. Usually. Um, you want to go through this process. You don't need me to do the annual review calls with you. Um, I do a ton of them. So if you do want that, you know, you can book that, but um, you can try to give it a, give it a go yourself with this. Okay. So that being said, I am going to go ahead and jump into studio um, once again, and I'm going to just show you. So the first thing that I'm always going to do is pull the balance sheet and income statement. I did pull them yesterday. It has changed since then because I was working on this, but I want to kind of show you what we're looking at, okay? So this is a balance sheet of my fake company. <laughs> and um, this balance sheet is cumulative and it shows, like for me, I look at the balance sheet constantly. I am constantly looking at this. And if you've done a call with me or work with me, I'll look at this every time I open your company, okay? I just like to know where I, what I'm looking at, okay? So, so the P&L, profit and loss, income statement, they're all interchangeable words, okay? And all that is is what you did for the year. And so this is one, whoops, I made it too small. But this is what we're looking at, okay? So before I get to go and dive in and review your financials, it makes no sense, and this is this is something that's a little hard to hear, so I want to make sure everybody hears it, okay? You do not want to review financials that are not in its final form, okay? What do you mean? What it, what What is final form? How do you know when it's in final form, right? So I'm about to show you that, and we're going to walk through um, in studio things that... Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I do every time I do these calls. And what you can do is if you wanted to, you can even open yours and kind of follow along with me. I'm gonna move this out of my way. Um, like I said, I open multiple. So here I can pull it through December, but I know that we're not in December, right? We can't, we can't fast forward. So I happen to know that this, it can't be, final for December. So what I'm going to do, you guys, I'm going to pretend for a moment that October is December. So if we were ending October, because I know that that's where we have, you know, I have the accounting done till, you can only um, look at books that have been reconciled. And I'm going to tell you why that is so important when I pull these up for you. Okay, I want to do a side by side again. Um, so let me pull that. And in this case, I'm going to just go back. Or did I do December on this? Yeah, October. And I always click no because I don't want to see all the things that have zeros. Okay. So I want to pull this. And you've pr probably seen me do this. So I'm going to pull it side by side because I want to show you what it is we're looking at. Let's go there and hmm. 
for me. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the financial statement. Like I said, the balance sheet is, for me, this is what the company is worth. Okay, this right here, the income statement or P&L, that's what we did for the year. That means it zeroes out at the end of the year. So uh, assuming you're on a calendar year and not some other fiscal year, right? Assuming you're on a calendar year, every January, this is gonna zero out and it's gonna ramp back up as you do business and you know spend money through the year. And then at the end, what we have here, this is typically what you're going, you're going to claim for your tax return, whether it's on a, you're a sole prop, a corporation, whatever that is, okay? So then that leaves me with this. People really don't, I see a lot of people don't mind the balance sheet as much as they do this because this is what they're gonna pay taxes on, okay? This is where they're, they're estimating to make those estimated payments throughout the year. But for me, this is where I live and this is where I kind of review. So how do we even know that these are right? You know, especially for those of you that are paying somebody, I don't expect everybody to be an accountant because I obviously, that's gonna take away from me, right? Uh, but what I do expect is I, I would like for business owners to kind of have an understanding of the flow of their business. You don't need to be an accountant to do that. Okay, I'm gonna walk this, walk over this and then I will answer questions. You can do this yourself. And basically, before I ever look at a, an income statement, because it makes no sense, we need to first look at the balance sheet. The income statement, a lot of times, is gonna play into part of what's on this balance balance sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna close the income statement, which we will reopen or we'll reopen it later. So let's work on the balance sheet. Okay, so when I look at this, I'm specifically looking at a few things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at what types of cash, credit cards, and loans are on their books. Okay, I always look at cash first, um, and then I'm starting to look for, for some other things. So here in the case of, that we're looking at, I can see that there's only a checking account and there's only an Amex card. Okay, so that, that seems kind of easy. So I want to look at that first. Okay, so um, I, I did, oops, let me pull this aside because I'm going to open some things and show you. So what I typically will do is I will first go to cash because cash means more to me than the credit first. So when I look at the cash, um, the, the bank account, and I'm, I am going to show you, um, these statements here, um, I am specifically looking for the total. So immediately off the bat, I wanna know, is this dollar amount in your checking account the same dollar amount that's on the most recently reconciled statement? And that is why I backed this up to October. I, even though you know we're pretending this is December, right? So. Does my bank account read 152, 152,000 roughly, right? I'm looking at it right now and it does not. Okay, so I want to I want to make sure that I show you this without. Let's see. Okay, the reason why I'm saying this is, and this is a fake one, so I'm not showing anybody's um, bank statement, but I want to show you. So if this bank statement ending balance right here says 81,697.40, why then does my bank account show 152? Okay, so that for me is usually, that, that's the first thing. I know that that doesn't tie. So um, I, I'm, I usually wanna know the, the difference right away. Okay, so I'm gonna show you that. Um, 81,697.40. Um, and then we have 152, so let's see. So the difference between the two is, you know, a little over 60,000. So what I, I always do is, I mean, that's kind of a big discrepancy. So I'm gonna look at that, okay? But before we do, I'm gonna look at the Amex. Does the Amex balance with what my last recently reconciled um, Amex statement shows? And in this case, uh, it does. 
and I, I did this on purpose, obviously for training. So um, it's roughly, it's a little off. So we're gonna look at it, okay? Cause that's the first thing. If these numbers do not tie you guys, it makes no sense for you to review any other stuff because that, that, that those need to tie first. And secondly, um, that is actually what makes it audit proof. Okay, because that's the first thing they're going for. That's the first thing I'm going for, but that's the first thing anybody else that is looking at your books to scrutinize them is going to go for. Because that that's really a, a huge sign there for me. Um, so what exactly? How, how? What are we looking for? Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just take you there. So under the reconciliation tab, I am just going to go back and go to the last statement. Okay. So at, on, oops. On September 30th, I see that we tied out. I know that's the beginning balance for October. Okay, this is what it would look like on the reconciliation. So now I know that this is the beginning balance. So I'm gonna put it up here, 81697.40. And then I'm gonna change it. This statement ending date always needs to be the, state, the statement date of your um, bank statement. If it ends on a weird date, that's not the last day of the month use that date okay so now what i'm seeing is i do see i always look at this and it does tie out here but what's causing the discrepancy are these transactions right here okay so i always check the unreconciled and hopefully you're saving the reports on bank rec because that's usually where i'm going when people call me with these troubleshooting calls like they don't know what the problem is or why something is i'm gonna i'm gonna go there first so in this case, you know, this capital contribution is increasing the bank balance. Okay, over here, you can see it, it balances, it ties out. So I did do the bank rec, but if you were not looking at the things that didn't clear, um, that's going to throw your, your financials off. Okay, and I see this happen all the time. It's probably one of the biggest <laughs> issues when the bank accounts don't tie, look for things that didn't clear. So like in this case, I was gonna show you how to redate this. If I wanted to redate this in a prior period, I couldn't do that. That's really what I wanted to show you here. So if I went, oops, this should have been dated 1231-21, I wanna change it. It's not gonna let me, okay? Cause that period is closed, okay? I'm not gonna put it in there. It, uh, it is a cash disbursement, which is one of the very few transactions that can be deleted in Studio. Okay, so I am going to delete it. I just wanted to show you what happens. Okay, and um, I love the fact that Studio doesn't allow you to delete things. I know that might be an issue for some people, but there is a rhyme and reason for that, and I'll get that. I'll get to that a little later. And then this capital contribution of sixty-five thousand, if it is dated so close to the date, I, I typically assume that it's going to clear on the next one. Usually I'll ask or I'll check, like, is, what's going on? Is this is this right or not? Okay. And for me, I, I always look at the general ledger. I mean, if I didn't know, 65000 is kind of a decent amount. So I would probably say, hmm, I wonder if we put anything else for 65000 Um, This is in the GL. And in here, you can see that there was. My guess is that this was just posted wrong. I mean, you can see it's the wrong date and everything, and it is a cash disbursement. So it, to me, I would double check, like, did this really happen or did it not? Okay, and in this case, I know I happen to know it's a duplicate, but because it's a cash disbursement, I will be able to delete it, okay? So I'm like, oops, I messed up. Good to know, but that's why we do the review. That's one of the things you're gonna wanna look for in a um, bank rec. And I'm gonna change the date. I'm, I just didn't wanna refresh. Okay, so there you have it. And then in this case, you always wanna review them, especially at the end of the year, because if it's okay to have things that are in fact outstanding, but obviously not something that was posted um, for January. Okay, that's not going to clear. It probably is a duplicate. My guess is that it's a duplicate of this. 
okay? I mean, you can double check or maybe it's the next month. But for me, especially at the end of the year, I'm, I, I'm cleaning everything. I don't want any kinds of lingering things. Okay, so I am gonna delete that. And now we do have it uh, tying in to the um, bank statement. Okay, and let's see. This is, yeah, let me pull it up for you. So that ties out. And then at this point, you are going to print the reconciliations. I always print them. I save them with the bank statement. So this now ties to the 90,000 that was, that's supposed to be sitting in there. And let me double check to make sure. Um, Cause I do want to show you that. Um, so it does, I, I, it's, here we go. I just want to show you. So this right here is what you can see. We have the beginning balance, we have the deposits, um, and then the disbursements are, uh, well here it's broken out by ATM and withdrawals, and then these are regular. But if you added those, it would be 6,748, which leaves 90,925.17, which we tie out to. So at this point, I would save this and this consider this done, right? So that's the end of that. And you would do this for every bank, credit card, and loan, okay? So that being said now, I'm going to look at the uh, balance sheet one more time. And I always kind of move them just in case so it can refresh. So again, we're pretending that this is December. So we do now tie. Um, I'm going to check the Amex. And I just want to show you Amex, even though it's a credit card, it's exactly the same as uh, reconciling the cash. The only difference, and I tell people this because I don't want, I try not to let it throw you off, is that it's in negative. It's a negative because it's a liability. Okay, so I'm going to just double check the Amex real quick. Um, and I'm going into the reconciliation once again. And in this case, um, let's see, I'll look at the date. Um, I did make Amex end on these weird dates. So um, I'm going to start with the beginning balance as, um, let's see, negative seven. Okay. So if you ever end a bank rec and these do not tie out to each other, go back to a prior month. Okay. So here, um, I am seeing that this is not the ending balance. So I can see again that this bank rec is wrong. Okay. It's off by 204.22, which consequently is the interest. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, make sure I post that so we can tie out. And I'll just do that in money out. Okay. And. In here, it looks like I just didn't post it. So this is my interest for the bank account or, or for the, I'm sorry, Amex account. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do that. Let me post it. So that way, now when I select it, we are now at uh, 9,161.38. And that does tie out to my uh, Amex statement, and I'll just show you here. And these are fake, you guys, I, I made them for the training. So in here, you have the beginning balance, and it's a negative because it's a liability. Um, we've made payments, and these two are the net because you know some of the payments, um, payments and charges, and now interest. So the new balance is 9,161.38. So now this is correct. So at that time, for me, I'm ready to review the balance sheet and I am gonna pull that up and um, we'll see that it now changes, okay? So we now know that the Amex is correct. We now know that the Chase checking is correct. Now, petty cash is a little tricky because we don't get a bank statement, right? But if you have a petty cash, whether it's just to have cash at the office, um, tipping your delivery, uh, 
all those different reasons why you might have a petty cash drawer. Um, I, I, I'm not against it. Um, I, I think the amount is kind of contingent upon how large your business is. However, this is still an account that just it doesn't go neglected. I still have everybody I work with balance this out. Like I want to see the receipts and I want to see this amount going up and down through the year. Okay. And I want to know how many times we're replenishing the funds. Oftentimes people don't babysit that, but it, it's still part of your financial picture, especially for those of you that have the larger companies and keep a little more cash. Okay. So I, I watch that. I make sure that that's reconciled. In this case, I happen to know that it is. And you're reconciling it based on the receipts. So when you transfer funds, I'm typically knowing it's from checking, right? So we, we, ta we take a cash out and we put it to petty cash and that sits in the office. Well, those receipts should be being reconciled to this dollar amount every, every month or quarter or however often you want to, but most definitely at the end of the year. Okay, so before we go ahead and jump over to the PL and just make sure for things, I want to just talk to you real quick about the um, sub ledgers. Okay, sub ledgers in studio are a little tricky in the sense that you cannot journal entry out of them. And I know a lot of people that like to do that. Um, if you have a CPA that is like, I, I don't like studio, I want you to go to QuickBooks, it's primarily because. They don't know how to manipulate the system. Okay, I'm just gonna be honest. Um, I talk to CPAs, so many CPAs every year um, when you know you guys will book your call, and I encourage you to have your CPA or anybody that you need on the call so we we can kind of knock this out at once. Okay, I, Studio is an accrual based software. Okay. It is not a cash software, but that does not mean you can't convert it to cash because I do that for so many people. It's again, something you don't need me for, but I, if I explain it to you so you understand what exactly that is, it's gonna make it a little less confusing when we get there, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna need you to follow along. I don't need you to be an accountant by any means, but I do wanna break down cash basis and, and what that is, okay? Because it's a common question um, that I get, especially this time of year, okay? So I'm gonna go over the subledgers first for you because the subledgers are important. Subledgers can't be journaled, okay? And what are they? There's five of them. There's only four showing on my report, but there is five, okay? So if you follow along, it's accounts receivable, okay? That's money people owe you, vendor deposits, Vendor deposits are monies you've paid to vendors for items that are not invoiced, okay? Accounts payable, money you owe on POs. Client deposits, monies clients have paid you for items or retainers that have not, it's just basically not been invoiced. So that lives in client deposits. And the last one that is not on this report is inventory. Okay, and for those of you that are using inventory, um, I hope that you are tracking that because I, I will do a separate uh, video on that. Okay, but those are the five sub-ledger accounts. Okay, so I want to dive into that. And for those of you that want to screenshot this so you can follow along, um, I'm going to move it to my other screen. Okay, because we're going to just dive right in and I'm going to show you what these look like and why it matters. Whether you have cash basis or not, these subledgers are important to us. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one, accounts receivable. I, I look at this um, with everybody and typically if I'm looking at it without you, oops, I forgot, um, then uh, I'm going to uh, look for anything that's old typically. Okay, so when I look at this, I'm just going in here and I want to know, are any of these old? Well, I can see clearly right here that they're, they're not that old. I mean, this one I, I, I might follow up on, but the rest of them are fairly, they're, they're fairly, they're recent. So I usually will check. Um, I print this, I save it. These aren't alarming. It's usually when I start to see things that are super old, like prior years or, you know, many, many months old. 
You know, um, it's a lot harder if you're not looking at this regularly, it's a lot harder to chase down money that's owed to you two years later. Okay, it just is. Okay, so to me, this seems pretty accurate and I would go with it, um, but I would pull it and save it. This is not something that I send to the CPA. Okay, so then the next one, that's all the people that owe you money for invoiced items. Now, I probably would check to see if they had a client deposit because if they had a retainer and they just didn't pay it or apply it to the invoices yet, that's the client's not going to really owe you that dollar amount. Okay, so I do check that first, but we'll get there. Um, the next, the next uh, account is vendor deposits. Did I make one on here? Um, yeah, I actually saved a, a report. I don't know if you guys are gonna like this one or not, but I'll show it to you. This one is um, my vendor deposits. Remember, I didn't have very many, but this is a vendor deposit. What I like about my report parameters is because I it, it matches, so that's the first thing you wanna look at. But secondly, it gives me the vendor, it gives me the order number, and it gives me the client, okay? Um, the regular report just kind of gives you the total. I like to know the PO because at that point, I can just come over here and, and look at it and say, you know, is, is that right? Why, why haven't we, um, you know, paid that? Or, or, or why, or does a client owe us? Or why do we owe this? Okay, so that, that's that. And the cleanup or anything that you find as a result of reviewing these reports um, is a separate call, okay? The, I'm just going over what I'm uh, looking through and reviewing, okay? If you find issues, and usually we do, that's kind of when we figure out what needs to happen at that point, okay? So the next one is accounts payable. Again, I made this report. You can see I, I made them yesterday because I wanted to be able to show you um, what this looks like. And again, I did the same thing with this that I did with the other report. I want to see the item um, uh, order number and the client. So these are the accounts payable. These are things that we owe clients for, or, or owe vendors for, I'm sorry. Okay. So if that is pretty accurate and, and you know, th then they're fine. If you see something that's really old or in question, like I know I shouldn't owe that vendor, go look up the item. That's why I like the order to be there. I just go under projects and pull it up by order. That's usually the easiest way for me anyway. And if anybody else has an easier way, I'm, I'm all ears, okay? So this is accounts payable. And then the last one that I like to look at um, is the client deposits. I just use the regular one. You can filter for a certain date, but I know that there's not anything in there in this case. And in, in this case, you can see here that it's only um, 6,500, which is basically, um, I, I, I happen to know it's a retainer. So I just posted it. It's not applied to anything. So it is in fact a client deposit, okay? So aside from that, now what's next? If I looked at all that and all that seems to look great to me, what, what do we do next, right? So let me show you. I'm gonna pull this up again because I want to side-by-side -side these um, for you. Let me pull it up one more time because I think it's important to kind of know where these go and what happens when we do certain things in studio. Um, let's see. Okay, so that being said, okay, what is cash basis? I am gonna kind of go over the last key points before we Q&A, but um, when I'm looking at this, since I now know everything appears to be correct, my next determining factor is before I review this, I need to know, hey, is this company on cash basis or is it an accrual base? Um, uh, business, okay? Be the reason why Studio is an accrual-based software, just so everybody's clear, is because of the way, the flow of our business. It, it makes sense. It is the most accurate and proper way to do this type of business, okay? And the reason for that being, and I, I'm going to just walk it through it fast, okay? When you 
collect money from your client, you're going to deposit it. It usually goes into your checking account, right? And that client, and the offset of that is client deposits. Okay, you give the client credit for the money, and it goes into your checking account. Okay, notice how it has not touched this income statement. Okay, so that means we know that this client is a go. They paid the retainer. We we deposited sitting in client deposits. Then we, you know, give them the pr proposals. We can move some of the funds to the proposals. That's still a client deposit. Okay, still living here. Okay, then from there, that usually tells purchasing or every, whoever's involved that, hey, these are the things that are approved on the project. So let's create POs to pay the vendor. We create the POs, which is now set up and if we pay them whether we pay them from the credit card or the checking account either one we pay our vendor and that goes from the checking account or the credit card to the vendor as a vendor deposit okay hopefully you're following along still okay i say this all the time and you've probably heard it on every other webinar that i've done okay studio designer does not recognize income or expense until you invoice the client, even if that invoice is zero, okay? People go, wait, what do you mean invoice the client? Okay, if we, if the client pays you 100% and nothing changes and we pay our vendor 100% and nothing changes as far as shipping or anything else, okay, nothing changes. And, and there's no balance on either side. I've seen people just say, okay, well, what you, I didn't need to invoice it, it was done. Well, until you invoice that item or items, that lives here on the balance sheet. That means it doesn't come here for tax, it doesn't get um, attributed to whatever portion is sales tax, none of that, okay? When you invoice the client, you don't see it, but what happens is, the money that's sitting here under client deposits based on the sales code of the item you set up. That's why it's so important. So this vendor deposit, when you invoice, it goes down here to cost of sales. And then this client deposit right here, based on the sales code, goes over here to sales income. And what happens to the amount that's attributable to sales tax? Well, it goes right here so we can pay our sales tax. Okay, that is how that works, okay? Then, that being said, if we are to do this in cash basis, and I, I did um, take the liberty of, of converting, just, I, I have a cheat sheet that I, I actually just, I save, I don't share it uh, for liability reasons, but I do have one because I uh, talk to people a lot. So I'm actually just um, tweaking it right now uh, to match this. So based on this uh, financial statement, this 356720 profit right here, you guys see it? Um, this, if I was to convert this financials to cash basis for the sake of tax, what that means is it basically says we're going to back out everything that is in those sub ledgers because on cash basis, you recognize the income and expense when you incur it okay so what i do when i convert to cash basis i'm just basically backing out these numbers in a journal entry that journal entry is posted on 1231 and then we pull the financials you know for the cpa and then it is reversed at 1 1 to put this back into accrual okay that's what tax basis is so the profitability on this exact financial statement that you're looking at is 13,707.61, okay, because of the journal entry. Once I do that journal entry, if, if required by your company, that is when I now review this piece of it. And I'm going to just do that quickly with you because I know we're, um, we're, we're getting ready to hit our time, okay, so I'm going to just walk over it real quick. Okay, and then I'll do a Q&A. But this P&L right here, um, when I go to review it and um, what I'm looking at, and I'm just gonna be honest, I typically am looking at all these sales and then I look at the cost of sales first, 
okay, does that seem accurate to me? So what we're saying is it basically took us, it costed us 30,908 to make 58. Now, depending on if that, if that looks right to you, to me, it kind of looks right, but then I start going line by line. If there's any kind of weirdnesses, I just run through it real quick. Because if there's something off in either of these pieces, the first thing I'm gonna ask you is, are you guys just coding anything to any sales income or cost of sales? Like without a PO, like you're going in money out and just coding it as you wish. Because that's usually going to be the biggest problem that you see in those those two areas. I'm not going to dive in, but that that's what it is. So if you ever feel the need to be coding things to either of these, it's probably going to be a little off. I'll just say that. Okay. And um, secondly, I I just I don't teach anybody to code things to those things. If if it if you feel that you need to code something there, it should probably have an item. Okay, and I, I double check, like, is that right? What What is that? This income miscellaneous, I usually I'll create a vendor commission account. I happen to know that those are vendor commissions. And that, the time billing, it seems rather low to me. I would probably question that. Like, that seems low based on these numbers. But, you know, those are the things I'm looking at. And then scrolling down even further, I look at the overhead, okay? Whenever you see a credit card or a loan, I'm always going to look for interest expense. If there's not, it's probably not reconciled. Meals and entertainment, that's pretty broad. Office expense, you know, I mean, I, I always will scrutinize office expense. And if you look, I don't have a miscellaneous. I don't do miscellaneous. I don't, I, I personally don't like anything called miscellaneous. I mean, it's a red flag. It would be a red flag for me, too. Okay. And then these outside services typically are going to be contractors, um, professional fees, anybody that you're not paying from um, payroll. Okay. I do have a rent. I double check it. I always double check the rent. Like, is there, is it, does it tie in with the exact amount? Like, what's your rent? Does that tie in with what it would be for the year? If it's not, then, then there's some adjustments. Is there things that maybe were reimbursables? Are there things that are coded there that aren't correct? Is there a security deposit in there? Because a security deposit would not live there. Security deposit would be on the balance sheet, okay? Software, okay, and telephone. So I'm okay with all of these, but typically I'm asking questions and looking at what makes sense based on what I saw on the balance sheet, okay? And um, I'm a big believer in, you know, really separating personal and business i'm a big believer in that because until i can really like drill down and look at these like i don't want to see any personal expenses now do i think that your business you know can afford to pay postage to send i don't know to send your sister a package yes i do however we're not going to post it anywhere here i leave them separately because I want to know your true, true picture here, and I want to know if it makes sense. The higher your income is, the more expenses you get to claim. And when you're saying that you only made, you know, five thousand a year, but you're spending, um, you know, fifteen thousand of it on meals and entertainment, you know, there's just things that needs to make sense. So um, that is about the amount of time that I have, at least for this. I hope you found it in. Formative. I hope I didn't lose any of you during the course of this call. Um, but this is basically everything that I do on these financial or annual financial review calls. I do many, many, many of these. Um, typically, they start around December and they run through till about April. So, um, you know, you always want to be checking these. And then that's how you know that they're ready to go to your your CPA or tax person. And if they are not asking you for the balance sheet and income statement, um, I mean, I, I, I would question that, okay? I, I might ask if they're a CPA is, I guess, where I'm going with that. Um, you need to see the other and they don't, not reading it on the phone, they need to have a copy of your, those are the only two pieces of paper that they need. Okay, so that being said, I am going to turn it over to Sarah. I think I went over this time.
um, but I'm happy to answer as many questions as we can get through. And I just want to say thank you for um, supporting me and to take time out of your busy schedules and listen to the webinar. So thank you. All right, Marie, let's get to questions. So our first question comes in from Shao Lin. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Bear with me. Um, but her question is in regards to a CPA that you were just speaking about. So how do you prepare a CPA who's used QuickBooks to be able to understand <laughs> Studio? And what reports do you send or how do you show them everything? Well, for me, it does, for, and this is what I say to everybody all across the board, okay? Um, I, I'm partial to Studio. However, I am not, I, I don't work for them. I, I'm, I'm not getting paid like that. It's, it's a really, truly a partnership. Um, I, I, I like them because of, everything that it offers okay studio is created in a way for your for your safety like I, you don't want anybody including me including your cpa including yourself to just be able to arbitrarily delete things from your program that that's not that's not it even when there's mistakes i don't believe in deleting there's ways to hide things but as far as answering your question um the majority of CPAs that push back on the on on studio um, usually are are okay with it once I've talked with them. I, I I mean I think they just don't like the ability to go in there and tweak things. But I always go back to say you know for me I don't care if if they did it on a spreadsheet. I I know what I'm doing. So it to me the software is irrelevant. Like I could do it on paper if I had to. What I care about is that the numbers are correct and that they would pass an audit. Okay, and, and that's it. And that's it. And they can, the, the interior designer, architect, or business owner can do any platform tool or software that they want to use. So that being said, it's not created for us. Um, and if you'd like to book a call, I usually <laughs> tell them to then. And there's a lot that I consult with and a lot of them work with a lot of um, interior designers. I personally am looking for a really good CPA to part out all the tax. I, I plan, I retired from tax this year, so I do not, I, I do not wanna do any more tax, but I am looking for somebody. And if I find somebody good, um, I will have a referral for everybody. Okay, great. So our next question comes in from Diane. How do you fix a difference between the outstanding and reconciled columns? Um, well, there should really not be um, a discrepancy um, in those amounts. And I'm just going to try to go to one of these. So like when what we're looking at here, guys, and I'm just going to show you real quick is when you start the bank rec, you saw it was really it was really um, simple. I'm going to just take them all out real quick since there wasn't that many. OK, so this is what it looks like when you put the beginning balance. If you put the beginning balance and it does not look like this, stop what you're doing, because there's a problem in a prior period. And that's why I don't know if you notice I have a lot of tabs open. I don't go in and out of the same tab that I, I just noticed that uh, when I see people work at that capacity, because I work with many of you through shared screen call, I see you guys go in and out of only one tab. Well, every single time, like you can miss things. So if you reconcile this and this changes the date or you're, you accidentally enter it wrong, you're going to reconcile that item on the wrong date and it's going to it's going to screw it up. Okay, and once you have a mistake, it carries forward until you find it. So it'll always be there, even if it's a penny. I'm not, I'm, none of my clients are off by that rounding penny ever. So I do know that it works. Okay, our next question comes in from Tabitha regarding the balance sheet. On the mm -hmm. vendor deposit with purchase order and client report, does that tie to the balance sheet? Can you run that after close and generate a schedule of vendor deposits on the balance sheet? Yes, you can. Um, and that's something I, I, I would do. I, I did save that and I'm going to just pull the report parameters for those of you that want it. This is the vendor deposit report. I mean, I like it. I've used it for a long time. This is it. This is the standard report that comes to studio. 
okay? What I did was I just tweaked mine and I just save, depending on who I'm working with, I try to save these like little reports. So this one, the only difference between mine and studios is that I added, um, I added a little more info because for me, once I, I know the PO, I can then, um, I can then just go over here and pull it up by the PO. Well, where is it? Let's see. Um, 20009. Yeah. So I'll just, let me see if that's it. Yeah. So that's, that's why I like it. So it can just pull up like that. Okay. Did, and if you wanted to see the report parameters, I'll show you them right now. That's what they are. If anybody wants to screenshot. It's literally the same report. I just tweaked it and saved the template. All right, great. So next question comes in from um, Angie. If a credit card statement cycles on the 15th, how do you reconcile it at the end of the quarter or the year? I will always reconcile it. If, if my Amex ended on the 19th, I would do it on the 19th. You, you always will follow the statement ending date on any account that you're going to reconcile unless it is one that does not have a statement like suspense petty cash um maybe i don't know if any of you have any like weird accounts any account that you don't have a physical statement for and I, I don't mean a credit card or any of that because if you don't have one i create backup when i don't have one like if, if they say oh we didn't have a statement because it's a zero balance i create one i just i, I pull the, the page from the the month before and the month month after i put them together and say no statement but i always create backup always but you always want to reconcile it on the actual statement date whenever you have one okay that's the only way it'll come out correct all right, our next question comes in from Molly. Do you recommend converting your financials to a cash basis to report income to your CPA? Um, that is contingent upon um, what your entity structure is. For the most part, um, not everybody is able to do accrual. Just so you know, the majority of businesses do uh, report in cash. That's why I, I do a lot of those calls. Um, so there, there is a rhyme or reason. So you want to just double check. Um, I will say um, most of the corporations that have, uh, I don't know what the threshold is, but you should be making a certain amount of money. And I don't want to like quote the exact dollar amount, but, but that's usually my, my indicator. I, I go by, because they have to file a form for you to do that. So I usually will check with the CPA and I'm adamant about checking with them. And for those of you that don't know, or it's not a secret, um, I'm gonna just show you from the user guide. I think you can even just pull it up if you don't know already. Um, this is literally what I do. It, it It is a little confusing. That's why I wouldn't recommend, I don't, try to teach it to everybody, but you can search and, and do your due diligence here. The majority of businesses that are sole prop are gonna be a um, cash basis. And, and that being said, I, I do wanna point out if you are on a cash basis, you're not gonna have a lot of write-offs just so you know, like write-offs in terms of bad debt. Because remember, remember on an, a cash basis, you don't have accounts receivable. So how could you write off bad debt? I, I do want to make sure I point that out. So you want to check with your CPA on whether you're a cash or accrual ba based business for the sake of tax, and then make sure that you follow that. And once you submit your financials, you guys, to your, your CPA, you're not going to touch that prior period. You're not going to change anything. The only time that you're going to really change or touch anything is once they come back. They'll either give you a list of adjustments or once the tax return comes back, if it's a Schedule C, I, I, I want to compare it. If it's not a Schedule C and your business files its own tax return, that's still going to need to tie out to your financials. So I make sure that it does. I make sure that I question anything that doesn't. I'm just going to compare it. And then I save a copy of the financials with the tax return in our files to make sure that should we ever have to pull them out, here's all the information and at least 
I know that it tied. If there's um, depreciation or anything like that, you're going to want to post that before you close the year. It should tie out completely and any book to tax difference, I document. Like, okay. you know, home office or something like that, you know, little things. Okay, great. Thanks, Marie. So this will be our last question for today okay. uh, for, from Tiffany. So if we are wrapping up our studio designer account, what reports should we need to take with us when closing the year? Um, I personally, I pull a balance sheet, income statement. Income statement is also referred to as profit and loss, p and it's all the same. Those are the two main things that anybody, banks, anybody, banks, um, IRS, those are the two pieces that they are going to request. And that's really the only two pieces they need unless they ask for it, which I, I always wait to ask. So I only give those two um, and make sure it's in the version that they need. And then I, I just wait for them to to ask, but typically that that's all they need because you you've reviewed and done your due diligence on the sub ledgers. Okay, great. That concludes our questions for today's webinar. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share uh, Marie's contact information and yeah. the studio supports information for everybody. So Marie's direct email, Marie at MarieVaton.com and her website, mariebaton.com. And as always, you can reach the internal support team. Their email is support at studiodesigner.com. You can chat with the support team and schedule non-billable 15-minute phone calls. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you so much again, Marie. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate you. Have a good, good day, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay.